given this talk a number of times over the years. Some of you may have seen versions of it, uh, parts of it. Uh, I kind of updated it a little bit. Um, but it's just historical highlights of Northeast Philadelphia. Uh, I actually think it really would be better called historical superlatives of Northeast Philadelphia because I'm really talking about Northeast Philadelphia being home to the oldest this and the first that and the largest this and the only surviving that. So it's all these things that sort of are kind of milestones of Northeast Philadelphia history. I kind of go through it chronologically, uh, jumping all over the Northeast from the north to the south, east to the west, but kind of uh, in a timeline. Uh, so you'll sort of get whiplash from the way I'm jumping all around geographically. Uh, but I do want to, some people that maybe aren't as familiar with uh, Northeast geography, um, you know, what do we mean by Northeast Philadelphia? Uh, basically, Northeast Philadelphia is everything above the Taconi Frankfurt Creek, which is that creek right there on the south. The east, north, and west boundaries are very well established and not uh, cause for any argument. The Delaware River, the Bucks County line up in the north with the Bucks Creek and the Montgomery County line on the west. But the southern border people debate all the time. Some people say the northeast starts in Mayfair, Frankfurt's not part of the northeast, this and that. Um, historically and technically, the northeast begins at the Tecpoli Frankfurt Creek. And there's a historical reason for that. Uh, and I'm going to talk in, in a minute about the townships and boroughs that originally comprised the Northeast. But the southernmost of those townships was Oxford Township, right here. And the southern boundary of that was the Tacony Frankfurt Creek. Um, so it's the Tacony Creek. And then the Wingahoppy Creek comes in. And where they merge from then on, it's called the Frankfurt Creek. So people just, it's one body of water, but it's the Tacony Frankfurt Creek. That's the southern border of the original Oxford Township. And that's always been considered the, the uh, southernmost point of the Northeast. So uh, prior to 1854, the Northeast was part of the county of Philadelphia, but not part of the city of Philadelphia. The county was what's now the entirety of Philadelphia, but the city itself was just that three square mile area between Vine Street and South Street and the Delaware and the Scooper Rivers. The rest of the, what became Philadelphia was Philadelphia County, and those areas consisted of townships and boroughs, their own local governments. So in uh, the Northeast, we had uh, Oxford Township on the south, uh, Lower Dublin, the next one up, Moreland Township, and then Byberry Township. And then this is, by, uh, this is Polk Wesson Creek, which is the northern border of Philadelphia. So we had uh, four townships. There was another one that I'll talk about briefly. But uh, then we also had uh, three boroughs, which boroughs were just more concentrated communities that decided to incorporate into a sort of a more uh, populated area that townships were usually more rural and less populated. Uh, but we had Frankfurt Borough, and then Whitehall Borough was right below it, and then um, Bridesburg Borough. So all these local governments, townships and boroughs, comprised Northeast Philadelphia prior to 1854. Now, there was one township that was in existence very briefly. Um, Delaware Township was formed in 1853 uh, from the eastern part of Lower Dublin. So Lower Dublin was cut in half, and Delaware Township and uh, Lower Dublin Township. So this was Delaware. But that only lasted a year, because in 1854, the city and the county consolidated, and all those local governments were abolished and the city boundaries expanded out to encompass the entire county. So from 1854 on, all those local governments were gone, and we were now part of the city of Philadelphia. And oops, we were, what comprises the Northeast space, uh, was the, the city was divided into wards. And 
the 23rd Ward was this huge area that encompassed all of what is now Northeast Philadelphia. And so here you can see, uh, here's along the 23rd Ward, that's that southern boundary, the Tacony Franklin Creek, and that's what this area is. So that's what we call Northeast Philadelphia proper. Uh, city planners and historians consider that area the Northeast, and that's what I'm going to focus yeah. on. Yeah? What are uh, Northern Liberties, before the consolidation, what, what were Northern Liberties in Kensington? Were they townships? Um, uh, uh, well, there, were, there was another kind of government body called the district. Uh, so there were townships, boroughs, and districts. Northern Liberties was actually a district. I think it became a township later, but um, I think for a long time it was considered a district. But they were all basically local governments. Uh, Morgan Mensing, Pashunk in South Philadelphia. Um, so, so anything south of the, of the creek uh, and, and the, until you get to Center City, they were all local governments. Yeah, yeah. There was uh, Northern Liberties was basically that entire area. Um, actually, if I go back, um, you can almost see it right there. It says Liberties. <laughs> That's the you know if this map went further, it would say Northern Liberties. So Northern Liberties went all the way up to the Tacony Franklin Creek, and then all the way down to uh, Vine Street. And Kensington was part of it? Uh, Kensington was not a separate government. Uh, it was just a neighborhood. Yeah. So some things are neighborhoods. They're not incorporated into governments. Yes, Is this consolidation a friendly type of thing? Or was it uh, kicking and screaming? Yeah, well, it, ha it happened at the state level. And there was a lot of politics involved. And there were a lot of people that did. It was, I wouldn't say friendly, but it, it wasn't like violent. But there was a, took a lot of lobbying on the part of a lot of politicians to make it happen. The, the real reason, the main reason, was that you could commit a crime in Oxford Township and run across the boundary into Northern Liberties, and, and the, the, the constable of Oxford Township couldn't go chase you. So there was all this lawlessness happening. And then there were the riots of the 1840s, the anti-Catholic riots and the race riots. And so um, the police force was very fragmented and weak because it was all these local governments. So they decided they really needed a central police force and central sort of authority. So uh, that was part of, oh, thank you. That was part of the reason, uh, part of the rationale for the, yeah. But it happened at the state. It had to be approved by the state. Yes, Dan? Uh, I mean, Phil originally, I'm going to talk about that. Hold your question there. It's coming right up. <laughs> yeah, because I'm going to tell everything you're about to say, I'm going to talk about. <laughs> I guarantee you. <laughs> All right. So, again, the, after 1854, we become part of the city of Philadelphia. And the dividing line, uh, there's the far northeast and then the lower northeast. And the dividing line is Penny Pack Creek. This map, this is a city plan map, they call it the near northeast. Nobody calls it that. Everybody calls it the lower northeast. So, Bridesburg, somebody mentioned. Bridesburg is a very special case. They were not part of the Northeast, and now they are, and I'll explain why. So, uh, here's the, um, here's that Tecone Frankfurt Creek. This is Frankfurt, and it winds down, and then this is Bridesburg, right where it meets the river, the Delaware River. And here's a, a close-up of it. And this area here, where the Frank, it's now called Frankfurt Creek, See that big loop it makes? That was very prone to flooding, like really bad flooding. So in the, eight, in the 1950s, the Army Corps of Engineers redirected the Frankfurt Creek. So it used to go where that red line is. That got diverted, and Frank, they made Frankfurt Creek make a straight line down into the Delaware River. What's this, the cross street where that happens, where it hits the um, Delaware River? I, I don't know. I think this is Richmond. Lewis. Lewis. So they, this part of the original mouth is still there. And it's still kind of tidal. But this red part is no longer there. So again, going back, this whole area here was diverted. Whoops. Yeah. So here, here you can see it uh, on a Google map. So the. Um, 
This is the original mouth, which is still there, and this is the redirected part. This is all Brian's bird. Right alongside the bed, you like to. You, and then here, friend, is this one of your uh, area photos, I think, you took one of them? Um, this is the Frankfurt Creek, the straight of the Frankfurt Creek, and entering into the Delaware River, basically following right along the uh, ramp to the Betsy Ross Bridge. So the point I'm making is that Bridesburg, for most of its history, was technically not part of the Northeast, and then after 1956 or 7, it became part of the Northeast because the creek was redirected. So it went from being on the south side of the creek to the north side. Does that answer your question, Alan? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of creeks and streams, this is a fascinating uh, set of images. This is what Philadelphia looked like prior to being developed, you know, pristine, untouched. This is what it looks like now in terms of creeks and streams. See that? So what happened is all, you know, the bulk of the city got so developed that all the creeks and streams got um, turned into sewers, basically. So all these waterways uh, were eliminated. Uh, uh, Alan Levine, uh, Adam, Alan, Adam Levine, who's a historian from the Philadelphia Women's Department, has a fascinating talk on this. But um, what's fortunate for the far northeast, anyway, is you'll see, so this is the Penny Pack Creek, all the creeks in the far northeast are pretty much still there. Right? Below the Penny Pack Creek, most of it's been the channel of the sewers. And that's because the far northeast got developed mostly after the Second World War. And at that point, city planners respected the natural terrain more and planned the development around the creeks and streams as opposed to just making them sewers. So the far northeast is fortunate up, up here um, in that most of the creeks and streams are still there. Yes? Yeah, a couple of things. Also help that uh, when the city was originally planned, uh, they laid out a a grid pattern of streets, right. and they followed that grid pattern regardless of what was there. Although as the northeast started building up, uh, in some cases uh, they put in some streets directly over the creeks. So that's why I have some diagonal streets running to the northeast, right. but. Uh, this, this grid plan stopped short of any back creek. Right. And, uh, yeah, the grid started downtown. It's just, you know, very rectangular north, south, east, west. And as Alan's saying, it went all the way up to about the Penny Pack Creek. And then after that, well, you still see some of it above the Penny Pack. But all up around here, you see a lot more sort of winding streets and not so much of a grid anymore because of the God for that. Okay, so all that was just preliminary geography <laughs> about the Northeast. Now I'm going to start talking about some of the historical uh, highlights of the Northeast. So we're going to start with the earliest thing, which is the Pennypack Creek Bridge. Uh, it's the bridge, the Frankfurt Avenue Bridge, over the Pennypack Creek. Um, so Frankfurt Avenue was uh, originally called the King's Highway. And then later it was called Bristol Pike, and then later it was renamed Frankfurt Avenue. But the bridge that crosses the Penny Pack there uh, was constructed around 1697 at the direction of William Penn, who founded Pennsylvania, was the first governor of the prior. Uh, and it's amazing that this bridge that was built 300 and whatever, 20 some years ago, uh, is still um, operating and, you know, basically the same structure. It was widened in 1893 when the trolley went along Frankfurt Avenue and then had a major renovation just last year. Um, but it's considered the nation's oldest roadway bridge still in use. Perhaps in the new world use? Well, is that certainly the travel by traffic. Yeah, tra traffic, travel, vehicle travel. Yeah. yeah. So, so here's, uh, this is, uh, Frankfurt Avenue, probably at that point it was called Bristol Pike, and this is where the bridge was, um, still is. Here's some views of it. This is a really nice early 20th century view. This is from the Bruce Connor uh, photo postcard collection. And then uh, Fran and other people, I think 
mainly Fred, was uh, responsible for getting a state of spark remark. What was that, maybe 10 years ago? 12. 12 years ago. The King's Highway, in, we're talking in the colonial period, before the revolution, it was called the King's Highway. After the revolution, it was called Crystal Pike. Uh, it was the main north-south route uh, in the colonies, in the American colonies. So if you were going, and Philadelphia was the sort of de facto capital of the colonies before the United States was founded. Um, so if you're going from Philadelphia to New York, or Boston, or vice versa, you went up and down the King's Highway. You right. crossed the Pentac Bridge. Many, many, everybody in history, and founding father, every important figure uh, in early history, traveled that route across that bridge. I'm going to talk about one sort of uh, group of people. In 1774, so we are, we're still under British rule, we're still a bunch of independent colonies, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Virginia, right? We're not a United States, we're still under British rule. But a lot of the colonists are very unhappy with British rule and they're thinking it's oppressive and they don't have representation onerous taxes and this and that. So the colonies are beginning to start to rebel a little bit. And so there's a meeting called to address the concerns of all the different colonies, you know, from north to south. And Philadelphia is kind of central in the colonies. And it's sort of, it's the most populous city. And, and uh, it's sort of central. It's kind of the de facto capital. So this is where they're going to have the meeting. And uh, a group from Massachusetts is coming down, about four or five of them, led by John Adams. And uh, they come down the King's Highway, they cross the Pennypack Bridge, and then they are met in Frankfurt by a group from Pennsylvania led by Benjamin Rush. And what happens here at this meeting is like critical to the American Revolution. The backstory is that the Massachusetts delegation are considered very sort of radical rebels, uh, very sort of aggressive. They want to declare independence. They want to have a revolution, right? The rest of the colonies are very weary of this. They're not quite ready for independence yet. There's still a lot of apprehension about trying to break away from the mother country. So everybody else is viewing these Massachusetts guys as like, you know, they're just troublemakers. So Benjamin Rush and the Pennsylvanians come out to meet uh, the Massachusetts delegation in Frankfurt. And they have this meeting. And this is when Benjamin Rush explains all this to John Adams. You cannot take the lead in trying to fight for independence because the rest of the colonies are very suspicious of you. They're, they're actually afraid of what you're trying to uh, accomplish here. The best thing to do is to let the Virginians take the lead because Virginia is the most populous colony and it's the wealthiest and they have a lot of influence and sort of um, admiration from the other colonies. If he, so Rush is telling, ben, uh, is telling Adams, let Virginia take the lead. Uh, otherwise, this thing is not going to, you know, you're not going to get uh, independence. So that's what uh, John Adams does. So John Adams is really the real instigator all through the revolutionary period. He's the one that's fighting for it. But he realizes that you know, Benjamin Rush is right. So, sort of like Bernie and Biden. Yeah. <laughs> so this is in 1822. This is almost at the end of uh, John Adams' life. And he's writing to his friend Thomas Pickering. And he's talking about what he called the Frankfurt Advice. And he said, he's talking about what Benjamin Rush has said, there appeared so much wisdom and good sense in this advice that it made a deep impression on my mind. The principles, facts, and motives suggested in it have given a color, complexion, and character to the whole policy of the United States. And now he goes on to name all these Virginians that were given these leadership roles because of uh, Rush's advice. Without it, Mr. Washington would never have commanded our armies nor Mr. Jefferson have been the author of the Declaration of Independence, nor Mr. Richard Henry, Henry Lee, the mover of it. So Richard Henry Lee was the one who made the motion in 1776 to let's vote on this Declaration of Independence. I move that we approve this. So that's what Richard Henry Lee did. I'm not sure what Samuel Chase did. Uh, it must have been something uh, 
in foreign policy, as Adam says, Mr. Chase, the mover of foreign connections. You inquire why so young a man as Mr. Jefferson, who was then 33 years old, was placed at the head of the committee for writing a declaration of independence. I answer, it was the Frankfurt advice. So this meeting in Frankfurt in 1774, this is two years before they voted, that was the first Continental Congress in 74. The second Continental Congress in 76 is where they declared independence. But that meeting in 74 uh, was very critical. And it happened in Frankfurt. We don't know where. Uh, John Adams does not specify. Is there significance to Frankfurt or Frankford? Well, the spelling was varied in those days. It's the same town, but uh, Adams was just putting the T on the end instead of the D. But he was referring to the same place. Yeah. Spelling was very variable in the colonial period. You can see the same thing spelled three different times in the same, three different ways on the same document. But uh, the main, usually a meeting like this would have happened in a town, which were like way, way stations along these roads, right? Uh, so the main tavern in uh, Frankfurt at the time was the famous one, was the Jolly Post Inn, which was um, and Frankfurt Avenue and um, Orthodox Street, at that, at that location now. So that's about where the job was going. But there was another uh, tavern, McVeigh's Tavern, also in Frankfurt on the, on the main road. So it could have happened there. Uh, most people think it happened at the job post, but we don't know. But somewhere, probably in one of these two places, is where this meeting happened that sort of set the tone and set the strategy for the whole revolution. Now, uh, Frankfurt was the most highly developed part of the Northeast early on. So a lot of these firsts that I'm going to be talking about happened in Frankfurt, uh, or first or earliest. So Frankfurt Friends Meeting was established in 1682 at the spot where it still is. Uh, so it's one of the oldest sites of worship in Philadelphia, continuous. It's not the oldest, but one of the oldest sites of worship. Uh, you know, in the same spot continuously since 1682. The meeting house that's there now was built in 1775. And it's actually the oldest meeting house in Philadelphia. And then the, it, the meeting was originally called Oxford Meeting and Frankfurt Meeting. It's now called Unity Monthly Meeting in Frankfurt. That's at Wall and Unity Streets in Frankfurt. Okay. Yeah. Is that, of course, when the store was decided? No, so there's a, that's the Orthodox Friends Meeting, uh, directly on uh, Orthodox Street, across from there. So there was a schism in the uh, Quaker faith uh, in the 1830s, and the Orthodox and the, uh, what's the other one? Hicksite. Hicksite, uh, So the, that one became, this one began Hicksite, uh, the Frankfurt meeting, and then the Orthodox Street meeting was the Orthodox. This is the one that's across the street? No. The one that's across the street from the historical site was built in 1833, I think. This one was built in 1775. So, um, and that site has been a site of Quaker meetings since 1682. It's one of the oldest religious sites in, in just outside of Frankfurt, and also a Quaker based organization, was Friends Hospital, which is right on the boulevard by Alexander. Um, it was founded in 1813. It's the oldest private psychiatric hospital in the nation. And uh, here's some views of it. It's still there, it's still functioning. Um, what's really interesting, it's also the site of the first gymnasium in America. So there wasn't such a thing as a gym, a gym you know, in the uh, 1800s and earlier. Uh, there was a school of thought at that time um, that it seems kind of common sense now, but that physical exercise uh, would be helpful for treating mental illness. So this was like a whole new kind of approach to mental, treat mental illness. So at Frank Friends, they were sort of on the vanguard of these things. So they built a building specifically for exercise. And it was a German word, gymnasium, that they adopted. So that word really wasn't used in America. So they, this is the first building specifically built like for the first gym in the United States. Um, this is the interior. It got uh, demolished when they widened the boulevard. Um, 
know, expanded the number of lanes in the old way. So that building does big. What, what year was that? When they widened the boulevard? Oof. Was that 2030, 20? Yeah, it might have been in the 50s. The 50s? Yeah. yeah. I thought it was earlier than that. But I don't know. Yeah. So, um, also in Frankfurt is another important building called the Park Hotel. And in 1831, a group of local mill owners and businessmen in Frankfurt met there and created the Oxford Provident Building Association. This is the very first savings and loan institution in the United States. Basically, these were mill owners and others. They wanted to create a way for their workers to be able to buy houses. So it was, you know, savings and loan. So this multi-billion dollar savings and loan industry started in Frankfurt in 1831. Um, this White House here uh, was built in 1831 for Conley Rich. He was the first person to get a mortgage from Oxford Shopping. And this, so this is the first house built with a mortgage from a savings and loan in the United States. Built in 1831. Um, Conley Rich was the town Frankfurt lamp player. He also defaulted on his mortgage. <laughs> Seriously. So the first mortgage ever issued by a savings and loan also was the first default. That's a Orchard Street. That building is that house is still there. Uh, I took that picture a couple of years ago. Orchard Street is kind of right off of Church Street, east of Frankfurt Avenue. So Orchard is a little sort of a little north south street. Um, so it's kind of uh, east of Frankfurt Avenue, south of Church Street. But that house is on the uh, National Register, and you can go see the historical American building survey online. You can see. Photos and surveys. <laughs> now, the Park Hotel, where the Oxford Provident was founded, is still there. Uh, sort of. See that little peaked roof there? That's that. This is um, Frankfurt and Kensington Avenue. So if anybody knows Frankfurt, where Kensington Avenue empties into Frankfurt Avenue, under the L. Um, that's a long rock park there, uh, and then across the street. And this is like an auto repair place that there's like an addition on the front, but behind it uh, is the remnants of the Park Hotel, where the first savings and loan was established. Now, I'm jumping, uh, as I said before, uh, geographically all over the place. So we're in the 1830s, 1840s now. And this Robert Purvis is a noted African-American abolitionist and civil rights leader. He's living in downtown Philadelphia. Well, first of all, he's he's mixed race. His father was white, his mother was black. His father was very wealthy, so he had earned a lot of money. He was very fair-skinned. He could have passed for white easily, but he chose not to. And he chose to identify with his black heritage and fight tirelessly for uh, freedom and abolition and civil rights. He was a leader in the Underground Railroad, a leader in abolitionism and everything. Uh, he was living downtown in Philadelphia, and there was a Sorry, did you have a question? I was just going to say his uh, original home is still standing at 16th and Spring Garden Streets. So. Well, that's not his original home. That, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, that's the home he moved to. He moved there after he left. The, so he was living in a downtown Philly area. Uh, and in the 1840s, there were all these race riots and other riots. And his life was in danger. So. He had to get out of town, basically. So he moved his family up to Byberry, which was then the Sticks. I mean, it was Byberry Township, remember? It was in Philadelphia County, but it was not in the city. So we were you know, out, out to Boondocks. But he moved here to, for safety reasons. Um, and his home became a major stop on the Underground Railroad. And uh, so this, he moved, basically, so this is Byberry Road. Uh, and this is Byberry Friends Meeting. Uh, many of you know where that is. We met there a couple of months ago. If you went straight up Byberry Road here, you'd come to the Boulevard up here. So this is just a little east of the Boulevard. Uh, and then he bought this big tract of land here, across Byberry Road, and also here. And actually, my wife and I live right here uh, on his land. But So he had a big plot of land. And he moved. <coughs> 
across the street from the Library of Fred's Meeting, which was founded in 1683. Uh, they didn't move to this location until the 1690s. But they are also one of the oldest religious congregations in Philadelphia. Uh, they, as I said, they've been in this location since the 1690s. And they were also, um, in addition to having a very active uh, meeting of a congregation, they had, um, it was like a center of learning and literacy and science. They had a library library company. They had a library philosophical society. There was a library school. All these things were part of the circle of people that were affiliated with the uh, library friends meeting. So, so yeah, Southampton Road. Southampton Road becomes Library Road, it's the same street, yeah. Around uh, Fortin. Yeah. So Robert Purvis wasn't a Quaker himself, but he was active in all these Quaker-related organizations, and he sent his kids to the Quaker school as well. But he bought a little plot of land next to the meeting house property, and with a couple of other guys, uh, created this uh, trust and to build the library hall. And he, he wanted a place where they could discuss abolition and other civil rights kind of activities. Meetings were becoming very heated in the Quaker meeting house about abolition, so they didn't want to disrupt that. So Purvis and some of these guys built this library hall. And so all, a lot of famous abolitionist speakers came to speak at library hall. Purvis himself was one of them. You know, he's living there, but he was also very well known. So in the 1840s and 50s, Byberry becomes this well-known center of abolitionism, like known throughout the country. Um, here's a, a, a newspaper notice in the Pennsylvania Freeman, 1847. A uh, public meeting will be held in the new hall at Byberry. That's one of the reasons we know that when the hall was built, because <laughs> of this newspaper. Uh, next Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock, uh, at which the subjects of slavery, capital punishment, and other kindred evils will be discussed. Uh, what's his, I think it was, what's that? Uh, I can't read that. Lucretia Mott's husband, James. James and Lucretia Mott. Well, Lucretia Mott was a very famous abolitionist. Uh, and Benjamin Rush Plumley, Robert Purvis, and others are expected to be there. So this is like a notice in a, a sort of national newspaper about this meeting at so this becomes a center of abolition activity. Well, uh, that's it right there. It's on Byberry Road, right next door to the Quaker meeting. So basically, Byberry and Thornton Road, uh, um, Southampton on the boulevard. You come down Southampton Road east, and it turns into Byberry Road. That means it's just the same road, but the name changes. So it's right about there. So, and then, um, so this is a 19, uh, uh, what year is that? 1905. 1905, thank you. This is a picture I took a couple years ago. And then in 2004, uh, Fred and myself and some other people uh, arranged to get a state historical marker for Bible Hall. And those we tracked down some descendants of, actually tracked them down prior from the Northeast the whole thing. But those are direct descendants of Robert Purvis. Uh, their name, their last name for Purvis. The, it's the, the girl is a, a woman is a sister. That's brother and sister, and then the daughter of the brother. So um, they're all Purvises, and they all came to, uh, to the ceremony. Um, all right, jumping all around some more. Uh, Matthias Baldwin. Uh, is one of the great industrialists of Philadelphia history. And his uh, country estate was Wissanone, uh, in the neighborhood of Wissanone on the river. That's it. Um, so Matthias Baldwin uh, was sort of one of these really brilliant inventor, engineer kind of guys. He was always tinkering and making things. Uh, eventually became very wealthy. And, also a philanthropist. But he actually started working in Franklin in 1811 as a jeweler, an apprentice to a jeweler. But he was, again, always tinkering and inventing. He began making uh, steam machines. He began making tools for different occupations, like printing. But then he began to focus on steam engines, which were just coming into use, general use in the 1820s. And then he specifically began focusing on 
locomotive engines. The railroad industry was just getting started in the late 1820s, early 1830s. He was one of the first to start making engines for locomotives. So he built the uh, first, helped build the first railway in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, which was the uh, Philadelphia Germantown Norristown Railway. And then he built the engine that pulled the railway car. That's it there. Mm -hmm. back to the so that's the engine there. And this is a close up of it. You can see here, you probably can't read it, but that says Philadelphia Germantown Norristown Railway. And this is the engine that he built, um, the locomotive, and then it's pulling a, you know, a train car. So uh, a little bit later, he forms Baldwin Locomotive Works. Originally in Old City, he's got a little shop. Starts, business starts to grow, he needs to expand. He moves to what we would call Spring Garden, Calvin Hill. Uh, he has a place in like Broad and, and Spring Garden, more or less. It becomes the biggest industry in Philadelphia history. Uh, so this enormous complex is the Baldwin Locomotive Works, sort of a broad and spring garden. It becomes the largest industry. It's the largest locomotive manufacturer in the world, the biggest in the company in Philly, private company in Philadelphia history. At its height, this was after Baldwin died, but at its height, it had over 18,000 workers, employees. And they were turning out like hundreds of locomotives a month. Yeah. I want to get a picture there. It looks like it extends north quite a few blocks. Uh, did it actually extend to? That's actually that's looking west. Oh, uh, okay. So it did extend a few blocks north and south on Broad Street, but mostly it extended west. Um, oh, towards the school. Towards the school, but not that far. I, I thought it was located on, on the east side of Broadway. Well, part of it was, but most of it was on the west side. Okay. Yeah. Before I interrupt, was that like 18th Street? Right out like 18th Street? Yeah, from Broadway all the way, so that's like yeah, uh, four block. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so that would be like going west. Yeah. I think this is Broad Street. It's actually Broad and um, not Spring Garden. Wood? I think my, uh, I forget. The state was there, right on that corner. I'm sorry? The state. That's right. Well, that's, that's what's there now. Yes. Yeah. Right at that corner of Broad and Spring Bar. That was where the headquarters was. Yeah, I think that, that's like right here. I think right here. Because I know it went further north than Spring Bar. Yeah, yeah. Is there any history to his um, heirs as far as how much money they got and what they did with it? The, did they do anything significant? Or I don't know. There had to be a lot of money. Yeah, it. I don't know. I mean, the company went out of the family's hands. I don't think it went down to his kids. Because it, it was it was probably a publicly traded company. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. I don't know if that happened in his lifetime or after. Anyway, this was his country estate, uh, pretty much on the double. And then he died in 1866, and then in 1888 he was taken over by the old lady's home of Philadelphia, you know, the old, the old folks' home. <laughs> I think some of you might remember, because I think this, did Joe, you remember? Where was it? Uh, yeah, I'm going to show him that where it is. Where the uh, flea market is now. Yeah. Where it was. Right there, yeah. So anyway, uh, so there are some shops of it when it was the old lady's home. And I think into the 50s at least, right? Maybe, yeah. maybe 60s. And this is where it was located. This is State Road here. And that's Conley and Benner. So, and then uh, that's the parking lot. It's more or less where it was. This is Newman Paperboard. If you're ever driving down 95, you'll see that Newman factory on the river. That's kind of where it was. Now, not too far. All right, so back up. There was a Wissanoming Creek. And Wissanoming is a Lenai Lenape word, you know, the Native Americans. So um, Matthias Baldwin named his estate after this Wissanoming Creek, whose that name goes back you know, thousands of years. Uh, and then the whole neighborhood became known as Wissanoming based on that. In Wissanoming was another estate called Lawndale, which has nothing to do with the neighborhood of Lawndale. There's a, there's a neighborhood of, of Northeast Philadelphia, 
But this estate is in Wisconsin, and it was known as Long Island. It was the estate of Robert Cornelius. Uh, and, uh, as you'll see in a minute, this is basically where Wisconsin Park is. So uh, he's another brilliant engineer, inventor. Uh, he's a lighting designer, a metallurgist, and manufacturer. Uh, he's, that's his company in North Philly, uh, Cornelius and Baker. But he supplied a lot of the uh, lighting for the 1876 centennial. Uh, the real, I mean, that's not, his, he got into photography very early, uh, and then he got out of it. He didn't really pursue it. But uh, he takes this photo of himself in October of 1839, and this is considered the very first photograph of a human being. And he took it. Now, he didn't take it in his uh, estate in Wisconsin, uh was his, like, summer estate. His, his shop was on 8th Street, the low market, downtown, the old city. So that's where he took this. Um, first selfie. Yes, this is, if you go on the internet and Google the first selfie, this is what you'll get. Uh, because everybody can say, now he, he wrote in later years how he, you know, kind of set up all the apparatus, and then he had to run around to the front of the camera and stand there, and he, he was off center and all this. So, uh, you know, but you know, I don't know what happened. Yeah. You guys do where on the 20th of the market? I work in that area, down deep the market, whatever. Uh, there's a historic marker there. It, on 8th Street, the block between Market and Chester. Okay. So if you're on 8th Street walking down towards Chester, from Market to Chester, you'll see. I, know what I, mean. I think I see. Yeah. Okay. That's, that was where he shot was. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. What happened is, uh, this is like 1911, so he dies. Uh, 1893, you know, 20 years or so later, you'll see here it says the Cornelius estate forms ideal park. So the city acquires it and it becomes Wissanomian Park. Um, and there, there's a beautiful lake there and beautiful grounds. Of course, that's all gone now. I mean, it's still a nice park, but the lake is gone. And uh, he also imported trees from all over the world uh, and planted them on his estate. And Apparently, some of the descendants of those trees are still growing there. I don't, I mean, I've been told this, I'm not knowledgeable about it. All right, so 1839 is when Cornelius takes that selfie. Uh, the following year, Henry Diston uh, founds the Diston Saltworks, who later became Henry Diston and so on. So Henry Diston, uh, he's from England. He comes over with his father, he's like 14 years old immigrates with his father and I think his sister, and they're going to start a business. Um, the father dies three days after arriving in Philadelphia. And Henry Disson is eventually apprenticed to a sawmaker, and he learns the sawmaking trade. And he opens a shop. Uh, first, actually, he opens a shop in Old City. Then he moves to Northern Liberties. And that's where the company really begins to grow. It makes you know, a lot of money. And uh, in the early, he needs more space. He's outgrowing his space in the Liberties. He begins to move to Tacony in the 1870s. It takes years for this process to happen. But in Tacony, it becomes the largest saw manufacturer in the world. Um, again, this is you know, there's the Delaware River. This is all distant saw works. I mean, a lot of those buildings are still there. Um, but he had like. 4,500 to 5,000 employees at, at its height. Um, you know, his saws were sold all over the world. Um, now, the really cool thing is that he and his wife, he was a forward-thinking guy, he and his wife, Mary, decide they want to create an ideal residential community for their workers. So they buy this big chunk of land. Uh, the factory is uh, so the railroad is going sort of parallel to the river. The factory is east of the railroad tracks, down by the river. West of the railroad tracks, he creates this 500-some uh, acre estate called the Distant Estate. And um, there's all these deed restrictions. You cannot, there's no manufacturing allowed, no alcohol sales or no purchase allowed, no glue factories, no firehouses. He doesn't want anything that's going to disrupt from sort of a tranquil, safe 
family-centered environment. No yeah. bells in the churches. Right. Yes, no bells in the churches. Didn't he no donate land? Well, everything sort of uh, safe and quiet. Um, interestingly, uh, so, so that's kind of just in the state there, it's kind of hard to see the, the boundaries. It sort of goes from a Keystone Street, almost to Frankfurt Avenue, and I think from Princeton to McGee Avenue, if you know Tacoma at all. And uh, he divided it up into lots, and he sold lots to uh, you know, his workers, or he built houses and sold those. Everything very affordable, high quality houses. He wanted his workers to have good quality housing, so uh, they could buy you know a good decent house at a or rent you know at a reasonable rate. And uh, interestingly, the alcohol prohibition is still in force within the distant state. It went to court like 10 or 15 years ago. And, and you know, some uh, merchants along Tarsdale Avenue, some restaurants and all wanted to sell alcohol. And the community bought it, cost them a lot of money, but they won. That there was no alcohol can be bought or sold within the bounds of the distant state. And that state was put on the National Register to start places several years ago. But it's one of the only, so there's only two such utopian worker communities intentionally founded in the United States. The other one was Pullman in Chicago, the Pullman Park, you know, rail cars. Uh, he, he created a similar place for his workers in Chicago. The only two such utopian communities in a city. Uh, so pretty interesting. Does the one in Chicago still exist, you know? I don't know that it still has the restrictions and all. I mean, I mean it's still called it's still a Pullman it's village. It's, it's a, still a neighborhood. It's a neighborhood. I don't know if it's got any. The distant state still has like legal standing. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Jack, was it for a community? There was a guy that did glass work down in uh, Gilmer in the center city near the Woolen or not the uh, the Ben Franklin Bridge. Dyad. Yeah. Dyad did. The, did he, they also build it? Yeah. Yeah. That's. I mean, that's not in the Northeast, so I'm not talking about it. But Dyad sort of did the same thing. He. He was making elixirs and, and um, patent medicines, um, and, which were mostly liquids. So then he needed to have a glass factory so he could have bottles. So he created this glass factory in Kensington. Called, and then he had the same thing. He built housing for his workers. Uh, and he required them to go to church and go to right. school. He built schools and all that. Uh, and then he was convicted of fraud and put in prison. So uh, he's not quite in the same league as Henry Disney. But he, Dyotville, um, you know, was a going place similar, much smaller in scale. Yeah. Did, not, did not last that long. But they're doing the archaeological digs. Yeah, when they did 95. They right, they unearthed a lot of Dyotville. Right. Yeah. They found a torpedo right there. That was further down, I oh. think. Dyotville was in, in Kensington. I think I think we talked about this. Anyway, here's an ad for, you know, this, and this is a little later, but, you know, uh, be progressive and own your own home. Just in the suburban building lots, five dollars per month. You know, you could a lot. Now, also in Tacony, uh, at around that same time, was the Tacony Iron Company, and that's where the statue that sits on top of City Hall, the statue of William Penn, was built in the 1890s. It's the largest statue on top of a building anywhere in the world. Hmm. Again, these are all the superlatives that I'm talking about in North and stuff. That was built at the Tacoma Iron Works. And you know, here's some photos of the, the head, and that's the hand on the left there. Um, and there's Bill, Bill Penn on top of City Hall. So that is was it, built in Tacoma. Is it made of iron? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. And then they trucked it up to, because uh, they didn't have automobiles then. So. Now, what this. Uh, what was the It was. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I think it might be where that new Tacony Charter School is. That's um, where it was. Where the Charter School is. Okay, I confirm. Where that new Charter School is, where that was. Yeah. Right. Now, this is really interesting. This guy, Frank Schumann, his uncle owned the Tacony Iron Works. Another brilliant inventor guy. He comes to Tacony. I forget where he was from. So he comes to Tacony to work on the William Penn statue, settles into Coney, begins experimenting with solar power. 
And this is his house. It's still there. But the, the left is an early view. The right is more modern view. And in the backyard, he begins to build what he calls his solar, direct acting solar engine. He's the first one who makes a practical engine that runs off a of solar power. People have been experimenting with it, but he's the one that really makes it like useful. And it all happened in his backyard in Tacoma. And people would come, and he, you know, the, the, the machine would sort of follow the sun across the sky, and people would come and marvel at it. And there's some views of it. Um, so then, in 1912, the British government hires him to build the world's first solar power plant outside of Cairo on the Nile. So Egypt, at this time, is a British uh, a colony. Right? Uh, and so they hire him. He builds this massive solar power plant. It's working. It's pumping water from the Nile and irrigating the cotton fields outside of Cairo. And there's some views of it. What happens is World War I breaks out, and everybody leaves. All the engineers and operators, everybody leaves. Uh, Schumann comes home to Tacconi. Uh, plant rusts away, no trace of it. It's gone. Yeah. But really interesting, some, some family member brought in a map, a descendant of the Schumanns found the Tacony Historical Society somehow, brought in this hand-drawn map of where the plant was. So they were able to um, place the plant in its place in uh, Tacony, uh, up in Tacony, <laughs> in Egypt. Um, some artists took, took the map and then went and did an art installation based on the solar engine. So um, they know now where it was. And the other interesting thing, these photos, so there's no trace of the power plant, right? Schumann comes home and dies in 1918. And nobody knows anything about where the plant was, or it's all rusted away, there's no trace of it. Somebody, some descendant of Frank Schumann, in Tacony, uh, no, some guy that went over to Egypt with Frank Schumann in the 19-teens, took a bunch of pictures. And that guy came home too and died. And the pictures just descended through the family about 10 or 15 years ago. This person brought them in to the Tacony Historical Society and said, here, I have these photos. These are the only known photos in Egypt of the world's first solar power plant. And that's what these photos are from this, from this person that uh, just sort of brought them into the Tacony Historical Society unannounced. And pretty amazing. So here's Frank Schumann in 1914. The human race must finally utilize direct sun power or revert to barbarism. Right? That's a hundred and some years ago. We'll get to that. Yeah. Now, 1918 is when Schumann dies. Uh, that year was the year of the first U.S. airmail delivery, uh, which happened here in the Northeast. The first regularly scheduled airmail delivery, right? They, they had done some deliveries, but the first regular group. Uh, it went from um, New York to Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. So the first stop was in Philadelphia, in Bustleton Airfield, which um, there's Red Line Road, here's the Boulevard, and here's Haldeman. So right here is where the airfield was. Um, and that happened in May of 1918. Um, so the first airmail delivery in U.S. history was here in the Northeast. And here's some photos of it. And then our group, the Friends of Northeast Philadelphia History, we you know, both and Fred and Maureen and some other board members worked really hard. We had a centennial celebration last May, or a year and a half ago, maybe, um, at the spot where we uh, held uh, lots of those t-shirts. Yeah. Right upstairs. We have t-shirts still for sale, uh, <laughs> but that we sold. Uh, but there's the marker, which is still there, holding it in. Uh, Holman and uh, Red Line Road. There's Fred and the uh, uh, And that's the postmaster of Philadelphia, right? I think that's that. Yeah. yeah, the postmaster of Philadelphia. So we had a big event to recognize the centennial of this uh, milestone. Is that where the Wendy's is? Yes. <laughs> that's right on the front of the Wendy's Mall. There. Yeah. And there's a stamp. 
Uh, another interesting thing that never happened, thank God, is that a bunch of local businessmen were promoting Northeast Philly as the home for Philadelphia International Airport. Uh, Philly didn't have an international airport until like, after the war. And um, so this is uh, basically where the Bisco was. This is the boulevard, that's Holman, Holman Avenue there. So uh, local businesses were promoting that site as a, the home for the Philadelphia International Airport, which thankfully ended up in South Philly. Um, I mean, the airport, yeah, I'm not sure I can fly here with planes flying. <laughs> uh, Philadelphia, Northeast Philly is home to the very first professional football team in Philadelphia, the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets, which were in existence from 24 to 31, uh, long before the Eagles. Um, and here's some photos of these guys. They won the NFL championship. The first NFL championship in Philadelphia was in 19. And they played their stadium, the Old Jack Stadium, in Frankfurt. So, uh, what happened is the team sort of went out, of, sort of flopped and went out of business in '31. And the license for the team, the NFL license, kind of languished. And Burt Bell and this other guy bought that license and created the Philadelphia Eagles. So the Yellow Jackets are sort of the precursor to the Eagles, not exactly. Right. So we're Jack, where was that the Frankfurt and Devereaux Streets. Frankfurt and Devereaux. Yeah. Holmesburg used to be them back in the 20s. Did they? Before the NFL. Holmesburg. Uh, yeah, I mean, there were a lot of local football yeah. teams. Yeah, Holmesburg used to be All right, so now I'm just going to go up the river uh, and, and talk about some of the uh, really amazing estates that were on the river uh, in the 18th and 19th century. Port Royal, which is down in no, just outside of Frankfurt, along the river. Uh, here it is here. Here's the Frankfurt Street. Here it is. Um, and this merchant, Edward Stiles, built it in 1761. There's some views of it. Um, this one of the, a neighbor, Elizabeth Drinker, reports in, oops, in uh, December 1777, the British occupied Philadelphia in September of 1777. She's reporting on how the neighbor styles, how they ransacked, the British ransacked the house and stole everything, including their slaves and their coach and their horses and everything. Poor Mrs. Styles had to walk into, into town. Eight or ten Negroes, too. Yeah, that's what it says. Eight or ten Negroes. So this is, then the house sort of um, goes unoccupied, falls into disrepair, um, and you can't give old Port Royal away. And Henry Francis DuPont, who's the heir to the DuPont fortune, um, comes into the picture. So a guy in the late 1920s, one of his colleagues, a.k.a. Lloyd Hyde, who's a New York City antiques dealer, uh, is taking the train from uh, New York to Wilmington, and he's passing his house. And he sees this grand old 18th century mansion all falling apart. And, everything. and he knows that Henry Francis DuPont is real into antiques and antique houses, so he tells him about it. Long story short, uh, DuPont purchases Port Royal, has detailed architectural drawings made of everything, strips the house of all its doors, windows, paneling, you know, uh, ornamental plastic work, everything. You know, this is what it looks like after it. And then he's got this house outside of Wilmington that he's developing into a museum. And he's thinking, okay, I'm going to incorporate some of these elements from Port Royal into an additional building onto my house. And that's the beginning of Winter Turn, um, which is one of the finest decorative arts um, museums in, in the world, one of the finest in the United States, but early American decorative arts. But the, the genesis of Winter Turn grew and expanded dramatically over the years. <clears throat> the original uh, focus was on creating, recreating Port Royal. So this is the Port Royal parlor, all that detail work, paneling and all that, fireplace panel, that's all from Port Royal, that uh, Port Royal parlor. Um, you can see the, the door and the windows at the beginning, at the entrance to Port Royal. That's that right there on Winterthur. So Winterthur is basically originally based on, on Port Royal. Uh, moving up the river, uh, Edward Farscombe in, in Holmesburg, 
So Edwin Forrest is the most famous actor of the 19th century. The Forrest Theater in downtown is named after him. He purchased this estate in Holmesburg in 1865. He puts in his will that when he dies, it's going to become a home for uh, aged actors. And uh, he dies in 1872, and four years later, the Forrest home opens in uh, Holmesburg. And uh, this is some views of it. But what's interesting, so they, all these actors and actresses are living there, right? And so part of the will was that they had to do public performances but on Forrest's birthday and Fourth of July. Fourth of July and Forrest's birthday, I think, was about I think for Shakespeare too. But maybe Shakespeare's birthday. Yeah. But they had to give public performances. So there were all these like theater performances in Holmesburg in the twenties and the teens because all these actors were living in the forest. So and then um, this is an interior view, and this statue in here is, if you go to the Walnut Street Theater, you'll see that statue in the lobby. That's Edwin Forrest and Edwin like Shakespeare in the um, I think I'm going to, I'm kind of running long. Yeah, we're about a quarter after eight. All right, I'm going to wrap up. I got a lot more, but I got way more than, um, I'm going to do one more thing. Uh, this estate, and my wife did it, but she's, Somewhere it's here. Yeah, she did a lot of the, all the research on this. Fascinating story. Uh, up river a little bit from the forest home, right on the river, was Riverdale. Oops. Uh, so Joseph Harrison was a, an engineer and inventor, another you know really talented, brilliant really inventor. Um, he gets involved in railroads and locomotives and railroad design. He and his partners go over to Russia and build a railroad system for the Tsar of Russia. They become fabulously wealthy. Comes back, he has a man huge mansion on Rittenhouse Square. Art collector, a lot of his paintings are in the Philip uh, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. He becomes a greater. But uh, in 1853, he purchases this Riverdale estate right on the river, uh, where Pennypack Creek empties into the river. And he builds, a, this is where it is, so there's, um, there's Pennypack Creek entering the Delaware, this is the Harrison estate. Um, but he built a Russian-style estate. So he was in Russia for like five years, right? So he built, he built this thing with an onion dome, right, in northeast Philadelphia. And um, where is it? And apparently, like, the ships coming up and down the Delaware, it was like a landmark for them when they came to the, the you know, Russian uh, onion dome on this estate. Uh, anyway, long story short, he, he, uh, it's called Harrison's Folly because he tried to dredge the river there and create this whole elaborate dock system. But he died before uh, it, could get, it could get completed. So uh, this, it became known as Harrison's Folly because he had this really grandiose idea of what he was going to do with it and it never happened. But after his death, the city leased it, the whole property, and then got into a legal dispute with his widow uh, were about acquiring the land, uh, but the city eventually acquired the land, and that's where they built the Tarsdale fill, uh, Water Treatment Plant. Uh, so this is the Tarsdale Water Treatment Plant under construction in the very early 1900s. You can see uh, way in the distance there's the Onion Dome, um, and there again, there. Uh, you can see it pretty clearly there. And that became the Tarsdale Water Filtration. So I have a lot more on Tarsdale, but we're uh, running much longer than I thought it would. So I think I'm just going to end it there. Thank you, Jack.